All right, and as promised, Bad Weather Fans Podcast, we're joined right now with eight-year NBA veteran, Kerry Kittles, who is on my favorite New Jersey Nets team of all time, the 2001-2002 Nets. Now, I love the next year, but I think for me, growing up a Nets fan, seeing that first season in 01 2 uh, I'll just, I'll be completely honest with you, Kerry. It was, it was special. It was amazing. So it's, it's, it's a true honor to have you on the podcast. We appreciate it. Thanks, man. I really appreciate it. Those yeah, no, thank you for coming on. Those are some really good times. Thank you. <laughs> they were. Okay, so I haven't told Alex this, the Nick fan here, but there's there's a memory yeah. I have specifically. It was Nets versus Knicks at Continental Airlines Arena, okay? And it was the first time the Knicks came to Continental. And there's one play where Kid, Jason Kidd throws the ball off the backboard. Kenyon dunks it. And I remember, you know, being around all these annoying Nick fans. And it was at that moment <laughs> I looked around and I was like, this team is is different. They are for real. What was it like from your perspective? A, do you remember that? Or I'm just going nuts here. And then two, when you realize you're like, this this team's a little different and we've got something special here. Oh, yeah. No, I remember that play vividly. You know, I, I remember uh, Jason. Every time he threw an alley-oop to Kenyon, he would always jump while the ball is in the air. And it's like um, his expression, um, you know, of Kenyon's crazy athleticism. But you know, I, I, that team was a special team to be a part of. I think there were so many new faces. I was coming back from injury uh, that year. Um, Jason Kidd was his first year with the Nets. You know, we brought in Tom McCullough. We had a lot of new faces. Richard Jefferson, those guys were all rookies. And so there were zero expectations because the year prior to that, we were terrible. And um, but we came together. And honestly, it was the first day of training camp. Mm. It was the first day of training camp where we all looked around and we were like, oh, my gosh. We have, we have a lot of really good pieces. And just the chemistry from day one of, like, everyone on that team, all in one page, all on the same page, all bought into winning and, 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 and playing for each other, which was our common theme. We're going to play for each other. Um, really is special for, for, for basketball players at that level to all be all in for the team and not really think about themselves. And so um, to know on, night, on a night-to-night basis that you have a chance of dominating the other team you're probably going to win most of your games. That's a great feeling to have because you said 82 games is a long season. But when you're that good, it makes it that much more special. For sure, for sure. I don't know if you know this. We had uh, your boy Richard Jefferson on the podcast on uh, episode six, if anybody wants to listen. Uh, Two questions. Uh, One, was he this much of a pain in the ass as a friend and a teammate? Yes, yes, he was. (laughs) (laughs) Yes, he was. (laughs) He's great. He, he always takes jabs at me on Twitter. It's pretty funny. And uh, also, uh, he mentioned on the interview with us that in uh, 2004, when you guys swept the Knicks, you know, I tried a series I try to forget uh, that you guys lo- that you it, it was a lot of joy for him. Was it really? Did it feel like more than a first round sweep beating no, it, us, it, it us as the Knicks? It, it really <laughs> did. Because when you're playing for the Nets, you're in the Knicks shadows. Let's be honest. Mm. I mean, the yeah. media coverage for the for the Knicks just dwarfs what we always had in New Jersey. And then so then we come off two years where we had so much success, but yet you're always still hearing about the Knicks. It's just the way it is. It's just the the media is just, you know, they're in New York, we're in Jersey. So we get that. So whenever we had a chance to prove to them, you know, that we were the better team, you know, that was always fun. And then if you remember back in that series, there was some jazz between Kmart and, and Tim Thomas, and it was all that going on, which had a little bit of drama involved, but, we were just that much better than them. So it was nice to be able to sweep them and send them home. That's interesting to hear because now, you know, with the Nets moving to Brooklyn, it feels the, and I always said this, I still think the Knicks are the king of the city, but they're deaf. I look at it like the Nets entered the Knicks um, sandbox and they took some of their toys and the Knicks fans are now a little bit upset and the media coverage has changed from your Perfect. perspective. Have, have you seen, what have you seen with this shift of the Nets now in Brooklyn and kind of taking some of that real estate? I agree with you. So, you know, coming in there, sandbox is a great is a great analogy, great metaphor. So, um, yeah, I, I think being that close, being that much closer now to the Knicks fans, some of their fans really were now they're in Brooklyn, and they're in Queens, and they're not going to go to New York to watch a game. They're going to go to Brooklyn to watch the team play. It's, it's to me, it's a the arena is just a better arena, and quite frankly, it's a, it's a better night out. And now you have a very, very competitive team with superstars <laughs> that are just fun yeah. to watch. I mean, if you don't want to watch Kyrie Irving play and Kevin Durant play and James Harden, something's wrong with you. And so um, they have definitely st- stolen some of the Knicks' thunder uh, as of late. 
And if they could really win and, and advance, get to the finals, possibly win a championship, you know, I, I think they'll take over. They'll, they'll have to, the Nick fans will have to give them the crown and say, guess what? We're crowning you the basketball. And it's going to hurt the Nick fans to really have to own that because they just hate. It doesn't matter what the Nets do. They have to win a championship, right, in order for them to do that. But then if they do, they're going to have to really hand them the keys to the city, and it's going to be a, a great day for Nets fans. <laughs> yeah, no, it wouldn't be a great day for me, that's for sure. No, I get but- it. <laughs> uh, you know, with a healthy big three, it was obvious that to me too, that the Nets were the, the foregone conclusion to win the finals and stuff like that. But with the Kyrie situation going on, do you th- and it kind of brings it back to the pack a little bit. Do you think that there's still favorites to get to the finals and ultimately win it all with, without Kyrie if he doesn't play? Uh, if he doesn't play, I, I would say, I, I don't know if the, 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 uh, the, the favorite coming out the, out the East. I, I, I think Milwaukee still is a formidable opponent. Mm-hmm. I think that, you know, with everyone coming back pretty much, right, except uh, PJ, you know, they have DiVincenzo's coming back. So I, they're going to be the favorites probably, I think, without Kyrie in the lineup. And, you know, it's unfortunate that they have to deal with this, but I think the Nets make are making a clear decision right now. We don't really want to have this distraction. Let's mm-hmm. try to end this now. If we... Don't take a firm stance. This is going to linger and hurt our chances. So let's put our foot foot down now. And so I, I kind of respect that um, from from leadership. So, but yeah, I I think if the Nets are healthy, even if if it's just Durant, Harden, and and the rest of the crew, excluding Kyrie, they're going to be a tough out. And I, I you know Milwaukee may be the favorite, but they ain't going to want to play the Brooklyn Nets with with those two guys healthy. From a chemistry standpoint, how difficult would it have been for the Nets and thinking back on your career if one of the leaders of the team and the and superstars in the team was only there for half the time? From a continuity standpoint and getting a rhythm standpoint, how difficult do you think that would have been for the players in the locker room? I, I, I think in my era, we were uh, probably just in general, the NBA, most teams were just older, more mature teams. And, you know, our, our, our teams with the Nets, we were a, a very mature group uh, for the most part, except for Richard. <laughs> and so, <laughs> and so I, I think similar to how, I, w- I would like to think at least, similar to how Michael Jordan handled the adversity with the Bulls, as we saw in that documentary, right? You know, he had to deal with Robin. He had to deal with the issue with Pippen, right? He had to deal, and, and all teams have to deal with adversity. But when it comes from teammates who are, making decisions, right, that could potentially get be distractions to the teams and, and what their purpose and what they're trying to accomplish. I, I think that we would have the maturity to to move past it and and not let it kind of distract us as much, right? But uh, it's easier said than done, right? Because I think what we're seeing now from the Nets is this has been a dist- – he was a distraction last year because he was taking time off and there wasn't great communication from both sides. And there was a lot of ambiguity around why he was being out. So now they're doing it. It's, it's, it's reoccurring. And so I, I think now it, it's, it's something that the Nets, Nets don't want to deal with. So I don't know. That makes sense. And as somebody who uh, went through your uh, major knee injury and missed the full season, do you find it amazing how great – sorry to bring that up. Do you, know, do you find it amazing how great uh, Durant has looked post-injury? I know it was a different injury, but do you find it amazing how well uh, he's looked? I, I, I was shocked to see – I was shocked to see him uh, perform at that level. Mm-hmm. I mean, I mean, we're, we're talking about a guy who missed the season, came back and played, which I did. I was healthy. I played. I did well, right? We, had, yeah. we went to the finals that year. I was out. The year after I was out. But he comes back, and then now everyone's saying he's the best player in the NBA. <laughs> yeah. I mean, think about that. He's not only back back, but he is the best. He's everyone's MVP, really. Like It's like, if you had a choice, who would you pick? Giannis or Kevin Durant, you know, LeBron or Kevin, like this, Kevin Durant is, is, and so, I mean, wow, it goes to show you how talented he is, how committed he is, how much he loves the game and loves the sport, the work ethic to be able to, I know what it takes to be able to get back to, to yeah. take your body from being one place. We'll see what happens with Clay Thompson in Golden State. Mm-hmm. He's out a whole season. You know, is he, will he be able to re, you know, regain his form and where, and where he was performing prior to his injury? So, remarkable season he had last year. I'm looking forward to watching him play this year. He did well. I mean, gosh, he carried the Olympic team in the, in the, I mean, he went up, not only did he come back and play and do well in the, in the postseason, and I mean, 
47, 49 points, and then he goes to the Olympics and carries us to gold medal. It's like this guy is he's an incredible basketball he's player. Ball all the time. Ball, ball, ball. <laughs> he loves it. And when you hear him talk, what does he always say? I just it's all about hooping. Mm. All he cares about is it's just hooping. And, and, and that's great. I'm I'm curious, Carrie, from your perspective, and you mentioned this earlier. Uh, when you're playing in Jersey, had the two teams that went to -to back-to-back NBA finals. And I think this is where I have a chip on my shoulder, and it's why Knicks fans just get on my nerves so much in this arrogance. Was it ever frustrating from your point? You're like, we've got this incredible show here where we've got an MVP, and Jason Kidd should have been the MVP that year and not Tim Duncan. He's We're we're running up and down the court. We're throwing the ball off, off the backboard. He's kicking out to you for threes. Incredible defense. Was it frustrating to to then be like, hey, wh- why are we not getting the same kind of coverage right now? Yeah, it, it was frustrating. Uh, I, you know, looking back on that on those years um, playing in the Meadowlands, uh, you know, it was an older arena, and it, it just wasn't a lot. It was a it was very family oriented. It wasn't a young, you know. I mean, gosh, you go to the Barclays Center now, it's like wow. <laughs> I mean, everyone's in their twenties. Yeah, <laughs> everyone's in their twenties. It's like dark in there, like they like the garden, like you're in the theaters. It's so it's it's a dip, different atmosphere. Um, and yeah, we we thought at that time we definitely needed more more shine, right? We thought that we could have been promoted as one of those teams across the NBA. That's really funny. I mean, we're playing today's style. That was you know, 15 years ago. So, um, yeah, I know it, it, it's interesting now to be able to see how the game is being played and, 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 and what they're promoting. And we look back on those years. I mean, we, we did it all. We, we were exciting in the open court. You know, we had athletic players, this exciting superstar in Jay Kidd. And, um, you know, it's unfortunate we didn't win a championship. Yeah. Um, so how much did it hurt when you saw Kenyon and Kid play for the Knicks in 2013? <laughs> and that <laughs> success. Did that hurt a little bit? That, a little that, bit. That hurt. That hurt, man. <laughs> I, I, I tell you what, I, I was they happy were good for too. <laughs> they were really good. I mean, I yeah. was, I mean, looking back, right. I mean, they haven't had a season like that in a long time. So, yeah. um, yeah, that was interesting to see those guys actually in that, in that, in those colors. I don't like to think about that, honestly. <laughs> and, uh, yeah, I wish it never happened. Yeah, I send that pick to Mike a lot, a pick of them too. In Nick's drives me nuts. Ouch. Ouch. <laughs> drives me nuts. That's and you hurt. said you said before, you know, the Nets were playing a brand of basketball in 2001, 2002, more spread out, fast break, hit shooting the threes. And I was so I was at the Nets Knicks game in the Garden. It was like 2002, and I remember this game specifically because the Nets that day hit 14 three point shots. And at the time, they were like, oh, my goodness, 14 three-point shots. This is unbelievable. This is so many. Now you see 14 three-point shots. I mean, not no joke, like in eight minutes. H- have you ever thought what it would be like for you to play in this crazy NBA, especially as a, as a, as a great three-point shooter like yourself? That's funny. You mentioned, you mentioned that because I was in my driveway yesterday with my nine-year-old son, and we were just shooting around. And uh, I was just telling him, I'm like, th- this – this game it definitely suits my style of play as, as a player. I mean, I was an open court player. Uh, I, I love to play in space because I wasn't, you know, big broody, you know, brood strong guy. So, um, and then the threes, I mean, goodness, everyone I talk to now in the NBA, they're trying to get their players to take more threes. So yeah, like Brooke Lopez is shooting threes now like crazy. <laughs> I mean, it's, it's incredible how, how it's uh, how the game has changed. It, you know, obviously the analytics are telling everyone ha- has proven that the value of the three, take even just taking the three, is that much more important than taking the two. Unless you are, it's a for sure two. That means it has to be a dunk or an easy layup. If it's a contested layup, they really don't want you taking the contested layup. Um, they want you to kick it out for a three. So. I mean, this style of play, I mean, I just shake my head. I just, I'm, I tell the guys, never I'm around the guys that currently play. I tell those guys, you, you are so fortunate. Be, be, appreciate this because, I mean, man, you have it good. You have it really. <laughs> Scotty Brooks told Bradley Bill that he wanted him to take a few years ago. He wanted him to take 23s in a game. And he was trying his best to get Bradley Bill to take, to attempt 23s. And he couldn't get him to do it. <laughs> the most he can get was like 15 or whatever it was. And I was just like shaking my head going, I, I don't even understand this, really. It, it's just beyond comprehension. 
it makes you feel like you can come back and come and suit it up and play a couple games, hit some threes. <laughs> you, you know, I mean, it's uh, it's what the league is all about now. So I wish there was more balance as a former player. I got to be honest sure. with you. I wish there was more balance between the art of the game, like seeing more De- more of DeMar DeRozan's style of play mm-hmm. and, and others who u- really utilize the mid-range. And there's no post-ups. So we're not going to see guys back to the baskets. But the mid-range shot was a shot that was, I, I think, I mean, guys, Michael Jordan, Rip Hamilton. I mean, there's so many great players that really utilize that art. Uh, your your Nick player, Latrell Sprewell in the garden. I mean, guys, yeah. that's Latrell Sprewell and, and Alan Houston. Adam shot threes as well. But, I mean, those guys killed you in the mid-range. Mm. And it was a beautiful thing to watch because you just couldn't defend it. Mm-hmm. And you couldn't scout against it. It was it was really it, it was a beautiful part of the game that's just pretty much gone. Yeah, it's, the fast break almost, pull up jumper is is dead. Yeah, <laughs> you know, I nobody mean, you, does it. You better get behind that three point line and, and take a shot from back there. So, <laughs> go ahead, Mike. Who who was uh, in your playing day? Because uh, you did a great job on the perimeter defensively. Who 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 was the biggest pain in the butt to guard? So I get I get asked this question a lot. You know, who's the toughest guy you got all this stuff? So, right, and I was, I, you know, obviously every era have their superstars, right? And then when you were a shooting guard like I was, obviously you guarded the Jordans and you guarded um, Reggie Miller and those guys, Mitch Richmond. I mean, the list goes on. Ray Allen was no <laughs> – so, <Kobe>. but, <laughs> but I would say, yeah, I was just – I was going to go Kobe Bryant, um, in my opinion, in my humble opinion, of all those great players, of Paul Pierce and all those guys who were great players, he was just that much more exceptional of a talent. I, I, I think he, he had no weaknesses, um, and he was tenacious. He wanted to score on you every possession. And I tell the story guarding Kobe. I was guarding him one time, and, and he took a shot, and he missed a shot. And he's calling for the ball. They, they get the offensive rebound, and he's calling for the ball as if he just never took the, the previous shot. He's like, yo, yo, yo. I said, bro, you just took a shot. And he looked at me, he's like, he's like, whatever, give me the ball. And it's like, he just wanted to score on you every single chance he got. He was trying to attack you. And, and uh, but, but, but he was really, really skilled. He, he was super, super skilled. And, and, and that's what made him such a tough cover. Was he a trash talker, a big trash talker, or was it just kind never, of mental? Yeah. Yeah. Mental, never talk trash. Uh, the biggest talkers were the guys in Boston. I, you know, I think Kevin Garnett, for the, I never played it, you know, directly against him, but Garnett was, was, he had a mouthpiece on him and, and Gary Payton, he had a mouthpiece on him. But I would say Paul Pierce and, and, and Antoine Walker, those guys up in Boston, dude, in those play, they, they were mouthy. <laughs> they you didn't like mouthy. the shimmy, but no shimmy for you. Oh, I needed the shimmy, gosh. Kerry. The, oh, the sh- I, 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 oh. Uh, yeah. I, you know, people talk about the Knicks all the time because they're right there across the river. But for me, just playing against the Celtics up there those years in the playoffs, ah, uh, yeah, yeah, you, you could have those guys. Yeah, and that that those Celtics series, especially in the 2002 playoffs, you know, I'll, I'll fanboy out here. I don't care. I'll just do it. The pass you had to KVH for three that put the Nets up six, uh, I, I'll, I'll never forget that. I mean, that's the shot, got the Nets basically to the finals and – one second on the on the clock, kicking it out there. I mean, it must have just been kind of surreal in the moment. You got twenty thousand people wanting you to fail and to make that to make that pass, and then Van Horn swishing the three. Uh, just you know, I I I think about it. It was, it was it was magic. That was a that was a great play, and 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 you know, I, I remember playing in Boston when we, when we give up that big lead. I'm sure as a Nets fan, you remember that game when we lost there. We were up twenty five yes. points. They stormed back. They win the game. They're celebrating. They're thinking the series is over. We we got these guys now. We're all in their heads. We have a team meeting the next morning. Rod Thorne gives an inspirational speech to the group. Just re- reaffirms that we know we're the better team. What, what happened last night was a fluke. You're going to go out there in the next, next game, and you're going to destroy them. And sure enough, we go out the next game, I don't know, game five or six up there. We just destroy them and just take the win out of them. And the series is over. So, yeah, those are some good memories we look back on and, and, and playing some really competitive series. Yeah, and, and then curious because, the, you know, the leader of the group there with, with Jay Kidd, uh, did you did you know then or think that he would have an inkling to want to be a head coach and get involved in that direction? No, 
Really? No, no, not at all. I, I would say Jason was a quiet leader. He was a leader by example. He wasn't super, super vocal. Um, and so when it was like Jason Kidd's going to coach the Nets, I was like, wow. I'm like, this is going to be interesting, you know, because I thought that he just, I mean, we, he obviously has an incredible IQ. I mean, he saw things on the court two or three plays before they happened. I mean, he knew where guys were, but he, but he just, it just wasn't verbal. He just wasn't speaking it. And so even in huddles and things like that, he was just, he was going to go out there and just do it with his play. And we all just going to follow, right? That's the kind of leader he was. But um, now you're seeing him as a, as a, as a basketball you know, player now and so this change into this role as a coach, having to having to adapt and be able to communicate all those 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 genius thoughts he had as a player, now communicating that to the to the team. And hopefully now he's having his second chance or third chance or rather with the uh with the Mavs. Hopefully it's just a home run for him. Yeah. No, I mean with the Mavs I'm not really a big fan because of the Porzingis stuff and everything like that. They have they have like every ex Nick, especially even kid ex Nick. It's kind of funny every player me. that leaves, every player that leaves New York, you have an issue with them. But go ahead. <laughs> yeah, no, I, I do, I do. But um, no, I mean, uh, so it's just interesting with Jason Kidd in, in Dallas. You think that they're going to have a good a good chance to uh, to to be better with him as a coach, or you know, not a lot of coaches get three chances. So it's interesting that he did. So, what are your thoughts on that? Yeah, obviously, he when he played there, they won that championship with Dirk, and mm-hmm. and and he spent time getting to know Cuban. There must have been some kind of connection there, I, I think. And then, um, you know, I, I, I will say that it probably helped when the guy that's, that's leaving the, 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 the head coaching job recommends a, a, a former player. Uh, when we call out, basically say they should hire Jay Kidd because he thinks that that would be a good match for Luka Doncic. I, I think um, that was smart. And, I, I, you know, listen, we all grow and we all learn things as, as we get older and, Jason has, says a lot of very good things publicly about his experience coaching and, and what he's now learned from, from being an assistant coach um, with the Lakers. And so, yeah, I, I think I think you'll do well. Well, Kerry, this has been been a lot of fun. Really appreciate you coming on. You know, I could I could really just annoy Alex and we could go back on all these memory <laughs> memory trips. Um, I'll, I'll leave you with this one and, and then we'll roll. But I, game five Pacers. Reggie Miller hits the shot, which we now know afterwards with, with instant replay was actually 0.1 seconds late, but I'll never forget oh, wow. when Reg, when, that. yeah, when, when, then that, that's what changed actually the Institute in some of the replay. Um, when he hits that shot, I'm sitting in my seat. I fall to the side, hit my eye on the corner of the seat. <laughs> Obviously the nets go to win in, in double overtime, but, but I was there uh, with some of those amazing memories that, you know, you that, 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 that Reggie Miller <laughs> game was, was, I mean, mm. did he go back in time that night or what as a mm. player? I could tell you trying to guard him. I think he was 38, 39, whatever he was. Dude, <laughs> he was the, I mean, have you ever seen Reggie Miller shock and block? I mean, I, I, I can't even really, he was six, seven. So he had me about two inches and you know, I, I have really long arms. And so guys will always complain in the league, but they hated my arms because I was always distracting them. But Reggie, it was like that night, I'm like, who is this guy? I mean, I mean, obviously we know who he is, but it's like, yeah. we didn't. I didn't expect this guy to be that hot and to make those clutch plays. Then he drives down the lane and dunks the ball over like two people at 38, 39, whatever he was. It was, I mean, to me, it's, it speaks to, the, when they say like superstars and like, you know, with guys that are just that elite, right? You have NBA players, you have guys that are perennial all-stars, and then you have Hall of Famers, right? That's the difference. NBA players, perennial all-stars, they're amazing. Guys that make the all-stars team every year, they're good. And then you have Hall of Famers. They're in an elite group. And the Kobe's, the Reggie's, the MJ's, the Iverson. I mean, yeah, I can go to Iverson stories. We can, I can go all day on him. <laughs> they're just elite. And when you play against those guys on the court, you know, you know, you, the fans don't really know. They say, oh, he's good, whatever. Ray Allen, oh, he's good. But I'm telling you, when you play against the Hall of Famers, they're special for a reason. They distinguish themselves from everybody else for a reason. Mm-hmm. Yeah, that's well, crazy. Can, yeah, go ahead. I was just saying, it's crazy because, I, I, you know, everybody in the NBA is incredible. It's, 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 and I don't think the average fan understands how good 
NBA players are because, you know, like I'll go in my driveway and I'll hit a 15 footer and think I'm <laughs> the best player in the world. But I don't think the regular person understands it. And then when there's a, just another level of player, it really just shows how unbelievably gifted some players are to get to that level is just truly incredible. Like you're saying. I, 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 yes. You play against Alfred Payton at, at uh, a, a gym in New York city and Alfred Payton would destroy you. 21 nothing. Like, yeah, exactly. <laughs> and then you're like, ah, oh, right. And then you, you watch him play it. Even Drew holiday. Who's a perennial all-star Drew, he, now NBA champion gold medal, right? He's, he's a great player, but you put him next to Kyrie Irving and you're like, Oh, uh, yeah. you, well, you see you those see, videos of yeah yeah you see the difference right away you you mm-hmm. notice like wow this is what elite looks like so i i mean i'm a fan now i've been a fan since i retired and i i, I watch these guys and i know i can tell every level where these guys are in their careers i can see the growth i saw the growth in Giannis when he first came in to being right remember when he first came in mm-hmm. and anthony Skinny. davis was yeah. And Anthony Davis was a better player. And then he caught him. And there was all this talk between who's better, who would you take, Giannis or AD? And now two-time MVP, NBA champion, people probably will pick Giannis. Mm-hmm. The vast majority of fans across the NBA will pick Giannis over AD. So you see this growth in certain players. As a fan now, I can appreciate it because I know it takes a lot of hard work, right, to push through to, to get that much better when you are already an elite player. And... Um, you know, so I, I just I'm just a total fan now. I, I'm obviously a Nets fan. I, I just follow the team. Uh, I'm encouraged by what I've been watching the last few years. And, um, you know, I'm excited for this season, upcoming season. Yeah, it's going to be a fun New York basketball season for sure. You know, Knicks yes. getting good is, is really fun, you know. Knicks, Knicks, Knicks have definitely improved. And and as, as a Knicks fan, I'm sure you're excited to see, Very, yeah. to see this <laughs> year. And they're going to be – now the bar is raised. Right. There's no more going back for Knicks fans. So you can't look back on all the the D'Antoni days and all the Phil Jackson days. This is a whole new team now with Tibbs and what he's done with the group last year. I mean, wow. And now some nobody saw it coming. Yeah. (laughs) No one saw it coming. And you pick up a couple of key players and you get a healthy Mitch Mitchell Robinson back to, to, to solidify the paint. You know, we'll see what happens. Never know. You never know. They don't want to play Brooklyn, excited. though. They don't want to play Brooklyn, though. But it's, <laughs> it's, they should do well. They'll, they'll do well. They'll compete. But they don't want to do – they can't beat the Nets. My, yeah, no, I don't think so either in a playoff series. My dream is to get the Knicks and Nets in a playoff series and the Knicks to steal game one and then come on this podcast with Mike freaking out after a game. <laughs> Just give me that moment, and that'll be great. I'll be, I'll be okay. <laughs> there you go. There you go. Well, Carrie, thank you so much for coming on Bad Weather Fans. Really enjoyed the conversation. Thank you. Anytime, guys. I appreciate it.